Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to English Theatre Berlin International Performing Arts Center. My name is Daniel Brunet. I'm the producing artistic director here, and it's a thrill to see so many of you turning out tonight for our event in collaboration with the U.S. Embassy and the American Academy in Berlin. Before we get things started, I want to take just one quick second to acknowledge Martina Cole and thank her so much for organizing this evening for us. Martina organized the literature series for us for many, many, many years here. She's recently retired, and I, for one, am thrilled to be able to take in one more evening that she's organized. Now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Isaac Martin from the U.S. Embassy. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming out tonight. My name is Isaac Martin. I'm with the public engagement team at the U.S. Embassy, and it's great to see such a uh, packed house, a huge turnout tonight. Obviously, we have a, a great program tonight. I'd like to thank um, our colleagues at the English Theater uh, of Berlin, uh, Daniel and Gunther, for their continued uh, um, cooperation on this. And I'd also like to thank our partners at the American Academy in Berlin, who have um, brought two of their fellows um, from the, their spring cohort um, to be with us tonight. And those are two brilliant, accomplished writers. Lori Moore and Lauren Groff. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're thrilled to have you. And I'll let our esteemed moderator give a, a more detailed uh, introduction to, uh, to their very uh, um, accomplished resumes, but I'd also like to introduce our moderator, moderator tonight, uh, Gregor Dotzauer, who is the lead editor for nonfiction at Tagesspiegel. Uh, Gregor writes extensively um, as well about jazz and the humanities and was also awarded the Alfred Kerr Prize for uh, Literary Criticism. So obviously uh, the evening is in great hands tonight. So thank you again for coming out and now I'll turn it over to uh, our panelists. Thank you. Yes, good evening everybody and thanks for the introduction. I have the honor of pleasure of guiding you through the next 90 minutes with uh, Laurie Moore and Lauren Graf. And I will introduce him only very briefly, um, but I will try my best. Laurie Moore is maybe most famous for the wry humor of her short stories. Over the years, she has published Self Help, Like Life, Birds of America, and Bark. And three years ago, her short fiction was collected in an Everyman's Library edition with an introduction by Guess Who? Lauren Graf. <laughs> She's also the author of three novels, Anagrams, The Gate of the Stair, and what a wonderful title, Who Will Run the Frog Hospital? I should also mention that she's a wonderful critic and essayist. Some of her best pieces are collected in See What Can Be Done. It's a line by the late Robert Silvers, who ran the New York Review of Books, and I think he handed the books over to you by saying, See What Can Be Done, and then he had to write something from it. Besides all that, she's a professor of um, English and creative writing, now at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I will spare you naming all the honors and awards she won, but I want to mention her new novel, I Am Homeless, If This Is Not My Home, which is due to come out in June. A ghost story set in the 19th and 21st centuries, and let me quote from the cover text, an elegic consideration of grief, devotion, and the vanishing and persistence of all things seen 
and unseen. At the American Academy, she's working on a novel called A Father in Berlin, telling the story of her grandfather's trip to Germany during the Nazi years, seen through the eyes of her then nine-year-old father. Lauren Groff also decorated with way too many honors that I can name them right here, is the best-selling author of six works of fiction, including her most recent novel, Matrix, about a young woman in 12th century France. She completed her BA at Amherst College and her MFA at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a biographical detail I have to mention because it was there that she encountered Laurie Moore as her teacher. I think they have somehow become friends, mm -hmm. if I may say so, but we'll see how this works out. <laughs> Actually, Lauren has become my teacher. Oh, no. <laughs> sort of true. How do I talk after that? No, I just learned Is so it? much from your work. <laughs> okay. okay, go ahead. And in Sorry. September, Lauren's new novel, uh, The Vaster Wilds, Die Weite Wildnis in German, will come out and published in the U.S. at Riverhead Books and Klassen Verlag in Germany. It's set in the 17th century um, and it is about a servant girl that escapes from a colonial settlement in the wilderness. We will hear excerpts from both Laurie's and Lawrence novels later. So the evening's title, Where Do Novels Come From, might sound like all or nothing. And actually it started out as a way to leave the themes and topics as open as possible. But then I decided to take the question seriously. <laughs> and I want to embark on a little journey into the inner workings of the novel, of a genre that is not so easy to grasp. This is exactly why quite a number of well-known novelists have written books on the novel and the life of the novelist, both as a way of understanding themselves and teaching others. And some of these books will also frame my question, as you will hear. So, but let's start with the basics. What is a novel, anyway? Almost 100 years ago, E. M. Forster, the great British novelist, in a lecture series at Trinity College in Cambridge, which was turned into a book called Aspects of the Novel, um, for lack of better definition, just said that uh, novel is a fiction in prose of a certain extent, adding that the extent should not be less than 50,000 words. <laughs> when or how do you know that you've read or written a novel? <laughs> I, th I think we should add Randall Jarrell's quote, mm -hmm. that a novel is a certain, is a what, what is the, how does the quote go? It's a, it's a narrative of prose fiction of a certain length with something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all novels have things wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And so at the point at which you're willing to accept what's wrong with your novel and just put it out in the world anyway, that's when you know you've, you're done with it, that you can't fix it anymore. In terms of how do you know whether you've read a novel? You, have to, you just take the publisher's word for it, you know, and the author's word for it. I've never said, this is not a novel, have you? No. Well, yeah. yeah I say it about my own work a lot. No, I, I, you know, I would agree with this, right? I think that um, a novel is just, or a novella, or a short story is, is def defined by the author, right? Not the publisher, I'd say the author. Um, Sometimes the publisher. Well, the publisher always defines it as something, right? It has to be defined to be put in the library. But I would say, um, I, think, I think the difference maybe between a novel and a, and a novella or a novel and some other piece of prose fiction is maybe just in the fact that it, it um, wrestles with large questions without ever answering them. And I don't think short stories answer any questions. I think fiction is the act of asking questions. Um, and nonfiction can do this as well. So genuinely, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll try to come closer <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. to an answer, but you're right, we were just talking backstage that anything from a novella to a, sh to a long story can be labeled as a novel. Yeah. And I think it's the publisher in the end who decides, and because novels sell better for whatever reason, and mm. I'd really like to find out, even memoirs 
are, are labeled novels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, memoirs, you, might, you, may be, you may remember the James Fry novel, The Million Little Pieces, mm -hmm. uh, which had to be turned from a, from a memoir into a novel right. la later on. But the same way, it can, it's kind of also be the other way around, I think. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's try to find out about some specifics of the novel. Um, the wonderful Czech poet Jans Katzel, here he is in his German translation, is quoted in this wonderful book by Milan Kundera, The Art of the Novel. And he say, he is, it's a four line poem, and it says Poets don't invent poems. The poem is somewhere behind. It's been there for a long, long time. The poet merely discovers it. Um, that may not apply to every poet. And poem, but it's a seductive idea that you have just to find a certain constellation. I think that does not work for the novel. Mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of research. It needs a lot of time, maybe years, to construct <coughs> and build a world. Where is the novel? Mm -hmm. When it's not out there. Where is the novel? Do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> it's in your head. Mm -hmm. Um, it's in notes. I mean, that's that's about the process of it all. You know, you you start with notes. You start with with a certain amount of inspiration, a certain amount of time because it takes so much time to write a novel. Um, but I think that I think the novel is all the arts put together. I think it's music. I think it's the visual arts. I think it's theater. I think it's architecture, and they're all crammed together. And so, I, to some extent, I think. It's the supreme art. It's the hardest art. The Gesamtkunstwerk, is that what it's called? <laughs> Gerd Wagner, right? Gesamtkunstwerk? Gesamtkunstwerk, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very good. But where, where, does, where does the music come in? The music? Oh. The oh, sound, the prose. The sound yeah. of the sound of the novel is the most important yes. thing about it. Absolutely. The sound. And you have to read it over and over again to get to the music. And, and if the book doesn't have a good sound, you have to start over and get the sound right. Mm. Mm. Sound is very key. It's, it sounds a lot like a metaphor than an actual thing. No, it's uh, an actual mm. thing. <laughs> it is, it is. I see a lot of more music in poetry, I would say. But they're the same thing. No, 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 yes, no, they, they are. are the oh, yes, no. they are. <laughs> yes. They are. They're just um, different elements um, put together differently. I think, I, think, I think prose and poetry are very, very similar. It's music. It's all music. Um, but I also would say maybe the novel is the act of writing it, and then there's a product at the end that uh, helps you to write the next novel. <laughs> so I think I would say that the novel exists in in sort of the discoveries that you make as you're sitting down day to day, and it's the it's the the coming back faithfully to this thing and trying to listen to it and trying to find your way into it. That's where the novel is discovered, and then you have a novel at the end, but it's no longer part of you, and it no longer is actually it's no longer necessarily important to you other than the fact that it does allow you to write other novels in the future. So, you know, the, as the novel is a practice um, and there is a product that comes out of it. It's also a place where you have lived for a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. You live in this book and when it's done, you, it, it moves out, you move out mm -hmm. and you miss it. Oh, desperately. You miss it. And so then you have to, to some extent, each novel is made from the absence of the previous one. Mm -hmm. Because you miss that experience of living inside the architecture of the last novel. So you build yourself mm -hmm. another one. Or you turn against the last novel and you're writing against the previous novel in sort of a, an act of rage, which I do a lot. <laughs> I try to destroy the previous novel by writing the next one. Well, it still just gives you a new place to live. It's true, yeah. And new people to hang out with. Yes, thank God. <laughs> anyway, there's some research to do before you can start. And I think this is something where the two of you dis or, or differ. Mm. And I heard you speak about uh, the fact that too much preparation, too much research can hamper the imagination. There comes a point when you know too much about it. Whereas you, I, I don't know, I mean, you've written a historical novel now, and um, how did you get things about 
Were you afraid to get things wrong about the 12th century, about a monastery in France? Mm. You, have to know, you have to know many, many things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it can end bad. Mm -hmm. Can it? How could it end bad? <laughs> well, it's just two stories will come at you. Oh, yeah, she said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he, he was being provocative. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, like, or actually, historians don't quite understand fiction. No, but they do, but they do. And, and so they actually, they're... they're they, they produce uh, fiction themselves in a way. Oh, I like this. Keep going. <laughs> I mean, these are serious theoretical questions. Yeah. Well, we can talk about right. the Annal school in France. They was thinking about how history can be told. Mm -hmm. We can speak about the, the matter history, mm -hmm. the theory, and so on. But um, still, history writing is different from writing. Yes. Yeah. Historical yeah. noise, of, of course. course. Yes. Right. Yeah. No, they're creating a narrative, and the narrative can be um, shifted according to the viewpoints right, of the, the people writing. Um, I, you're not afraid because you can hide behind fiction. Right? And I think, in general, my 12th century novel was embraced by a lot of historians because they know how great that time was. They know how incredible the, the literature coming out of that time was. And, and whatever, if, if someone like me, who's maybe, um, my, my work is reaching people that they can't reach, and I think that, that, that they like that, actually. And there are historians that, that do get angry if you make things, if you mess up, right? Um, but I think, in general, people are so pleased that you share their love, right? I think that when you put an act of love into the world, it's, it's you know, people recognize it and are grateful for it. And maybe that's me just being an optimist. But um, Lori, uh, her next book, there's parts of it that his, are historical as well. So were you afraid of that when you were, you were writing your book? Um, I had, you know, I hadn't done historical fiction the way you have done and the way you've done again with the Bastard mm -hmm. Wilds, which I haven't read yet, but I've heard you read from. So I would really like to know what your research mm -hmm. process was like with that. With, with this book, it has a little historical heart that, um, well, it's sort of a bicameral narrative. And so part of it is letters from a, from a boarding house owner in the 19th century. And I did a lot of research on the 1860s, 1870s, and the whole Civil War period. I just did so much research, and I loved doing the research, mm -hmm. but I could only use a little bit of it, because otherwise it just, it just I, some, I didn't need it all. But, I, but at the time, I remember doing an interview, and someone was asking me about the research I was doing at the New York Public Library, and I said, oh, I, I know a lot right now. Um, is there anything you want to know about John Wilkes Booth? <laughs> and I had a big audience like this, and not one person, everybody said, no, we're good. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> don't, don't need to know a single other thing. And Deborah Reisman, or Deborah Treisman, Deborah Reisman was it? <laughs> Someone else. Um, Deborah Treisman said, well, what did his father do for a living? She just thought she'd come up with that. I said, well, he, he, was, he was an actor, and his name was Junius. And he was very famous in his day. And, I, and then I started, she said, all right, stop. We don't want to know. And she said, a genius. That's interesting. I said, no, his name was Junius. And then she became afraid that I was going to defend the Booth family in some way. And I have to say, the research shows they were all just the most wicked people. <laughs> They're just horrible, horrible people, but I do know something about them. <laughs> we can talk after. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the research as well. I think it is, um, it's, it's important not only for the facts, but also for the feeling of the book and the music, which we were talking about before too, because every, era has its own sort of sensibility that you can hear in, in the work that comes out of the time. But um, I could get lost for 
decades doing this research because it's so interesting, so I give myself a limited amount of time to do as much as possible, write a very quick draft to find out where the holes my understanding are, and then do more research in a more pointed direction, right? So it's very controlled um, all the way through. And then I just put all that research aside and then write the real first draft and then the real second draft, and whatever lingers between the drafts. I know that that's the living detail. That's what needs to be in the book. Otherwise, you can have these research dumps yes. in the book, and right. you can find some novels, and we're not going to name them, but we know we where know they them. are. Yeah. <laughs> where, where very good novelists mm -hmm. have done too much research, and they didn't want to waste it, mm -hmm. and they dumped it. In yeah. <laughs> So suddenly there's 45 pages of stuff you really don't want to read. Yes. But, um, and sometimes that's magnificent, like Moby Dick, right? Like that, that, that can Moby be Dick awesome. Is an exception. Yeah. I think we have to make an exception. I think so too. Well, you have to find a way to make research and imagination live in peace. Yes, together. right. But exactly. Right. I think you have fun. Yeah. Still, the term historical novel in serious literature doesn't say too much about the real approach. Mm. And let me now quote Milan Kundra himself in The Art of Novel. He writes, the novelist, and as opposed to the writer in general, he says, does not make much fuss about his ideas. He's an explorer groping to reveal some unknown aspect of existence. He is not fascinated by his voice, but by a form he aspires to, and only the forms that meet the requirements of his dream belong to his work. Fielding, Stern, Flaubert, Proust, Faulkner, Céline. But is this idea of a mainly character-driven novel, as opposed to the novel ideas, really true? I mean, we have so many great novels of ideas which are at the same time driven by character. Think of uh, Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, mm. for instance, yeah. or many, many, many others. Yeah. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. Mm -mm. I don't think they can be. I think they should have both things. I mean, I'm very fond of the, of the, the belief that a thought is a feeling and a feeling is a thought. Mm -hmm. So if, you have, if you're talking about character, you're talking about a lot of feelings that are also ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so ideas are feelings, feelings are ideas. And then you have an individual who's in a society, you know, which you're also describing and portraying, and then you have your struggles and drama and story, and the ideas are all just there, they come, but you don't have to, you know, eliminate uh, the idea of ideas. I don't think. Yeah, I think um, novels exist in different titrations, right? There's there are obviously novels of sheer ideas, pure ideas, right? And I have a hard time with a lot of them. Um, and they're novels of pure character. And I think Gloria is correct, where feelings are ideas. I also think that physical sensations are ideas in a very real way, um, and they act upon the characters as well. And so my ideal my book that I want to read every time I pick up a book is a book that has all of these things in almost equal titration. I want a book of ideal ideas, but I also want characters, and I also want plot, and I, I just want everything all at once. I'm greedy, right? I want something delicious. Then let's hear how it sounds uh, with a short sample from Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are we reading? We're reading from our novels now. For three minutes. Yes, yeah, let's yeah. do it. And I'm going first. Oh, whatever you want. Okay. All right. All right. I mean, the problem with reading from a novel is you have to sort of set up the little part that you're reading. This is only a three-minute excerpt, if I can find it. Um, and it's just this moment. It's sort of in the middle of the book. The the main character, and it's not it's not the the. Civil War era letters. Those are those are scattered through. This is um, contemporary times, roughly. It's year 2016. Um, this guy, the main character, is named Finn. He's been visiting his sick brother in New York. He gets this phone call. He's supposed to come. He gets this phone call from the friend of his ex-girlfriend, who, and his ex-girlfriend has always suffered from depression and suicidality, but she's also with, she's moved on to some other guy. And, um, 
So he gets this call from her friend Sigrid, who runs their book group together. And um, so he, he comes back to this place in Illinois where they live, comes back from seeing his brother. Okay, and so she, she said, she doesn't say anything. She says, you've got to come, it's Lily. You know, something, something's up with Lily, the ex-girlfriend. So, okay, so that's where we are. That took four minutes, <laughs> and now I'm going to read for three. Okay. Finn knocked on the door and rang the bell, both. One obeys, one's doom. Thank you for coming, Sigrid said, closing the door behind him. Finn left his coat on. She hadn't offered to take it. I almost missed the house, he said. Didn't you used to have a big tree out front? It got old, she said, and then there was a storm. What has happened? He asked now, getting to the point. Uh, you may want to sit down. Oh my God, he said. He sank down on the coach, on the couch, excuse me, his coat still on. The room, the white built-in bookcases, the hardcover books, the Mexican art, the new Mexican art, the one Picasso print, whose black lines match the wrought iron railing on the staircase in the corner, the furniture in shades called Don and Pete, like one's very own friends from elementary school. He had once thought such a jacked up, bespoke loving home would have cured everything. But he and Lily would have brought their own difficult and undissected unhappiness into every room. The ladies of the club met here each Thursday night. He now sensed hate and witchiness and emptiness, not his or even theirs, but that of the universe which had somehow gotten in and was swirling around. It shone around the absent ladies in whatever the opposite of a halo was, even though the ladies of the club had not yet arrived. The book group is not coming tonight, said Sigrid. Okay, Lily has finally done it, Sigrid said. Oh my God, Finn babbled again. He dropped his face into his hands. She had taken a turn, Sigrid said, and was not doing well. Finn pulled his hands away. He knew Lily like the backs of them. That is, he never looked very closely, too busy reading his own palm. But he had loved her always in that necessary, twisted, hurting way. The actual end of her, though he had imagined it, he hadn't actually imagined thoroughly. How, how, he asked. His tears became icicles now, frozen mid-drip. As I said, she was not doing well, said Sigrid. Why wasn't she in a hospital? She was, Jack took her there, but once she was there, she refused to have visitors. But how did she get out? She didn't, said Sigrid. The doctors wouldn't allow it. Finn didn't know why this had been turned into a guessing game. It caused him to stand, his coat still on. She jumped from the roof, he said. No. He pulled his coat tightly around him. She seduced the doctor in order to get his belt. He wasn't sure he actually said this aloud. Perhaps he did. For years, he had cleared her closets when she accumulated too many belts, their buckles like the stark hissing mouths of snakes. So how could she die? There was a long silence. He sat back down. How could she have died? They watch you like, hawk, like hawks in there. He said, they take away everything, any accessory to death. There aren't even curtains, not a shoelace or an earring or a hoodie string. Perhaps she hadn't died. She had staged it somehow to escape. He would find her. She would know that. She would know how to do that. And this was the signal that she was counting on him to find her. Sigrid cleared her throat. The shower, she said. But they don't allow you to have anything in the shower, said Finn. Soap on a rope? I don't think so. And there's always a guard at the door. She wanted to die, said Sigrid. Yes, I know. The guard can only do so much, continued Sigrid. They often have their backs turned out of a small sense of privacy. What do you mean? Lily wanted very badly to die. How well Finn had understood this through the years. Very little on God's earth could entice Lily into wanting for long to stay on it. Even dressed as a clown, as she cheered on others to embrace life with laughter. Her doctors were useless, Finn said. They all should have been set on fire in a public square. 
statements such as this were why Finn had no friends who were doctors. <laughs> this book um, so far and it's brilliant of course and uh, hilarious and so dark as you can tell it's really wonderful <laughs> do I read now or no? no. That, okay, I, know. I, I will wait, I will wait. <laughs> um, we kind can of discuss this in detail as we have we deal now with the context but I would like to move on to inspiration and one question would be, what made you write a ghost story? I'd, I'd written a ghost story once before, at least once, I think. Um, and I started to give this advice to people. And then I realized ghost stories are, are, are there's a great tradition of ghost stories, at least in American literature, English literature. Um, and I started to give this advice to people, to my students who were stuck. And I said, you're stuck with the story? Put a ghost in it. And so I just found myself saying, put a ghost in here. Like, this needs a ghost. You know, we should attend this dinner party, a ghost. But, you know, from Dickens to James to all kinds of great, great literary writers, um, ghosts are in our literature. So I decided, also you get to a certain age and most of the people you've known in life have passed away. So you think about them a lot. So they live as ghosts in your head. And um, so that's part of it. Mm. I would, of course, mostly think of Henry James. Yeah. Yeah, Edith Wharton, yeah. Edith Wharton. Edith Wharton has a whole book of ghost stories. Yeah. 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 But that's exactly why writing comes from reading. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, yes. whether it's right. reviewing other people's work, or mm -hmm. writing novels, or write, even writing poetry. And um, that is to say, it doesn't so much rely on your own experience, then it relies on the models of realizations of others. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? I mean, maybe you can write a second Robertson Crusoe, though it will be very difficult. You can write a second Heart of Darkness, mm -hmm. but you cannot invent the inner monologue or the stream of consciousness and you. So is there a kind of state of art you can't fall back behind? Who? Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, 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 you can write another Charles Dickens ghost story. Uh, no. I mean, no. well, you could try. It, would be, it might be very interesting. I mean, it's mm. been done over and over again in different carnations as, as film. Mm. It would sound like Beethoven's Tenth Symphony invented by algorithms, mm -hmm. in a way. Oh, now you, we're you going to eat, see, sneaking the AI <laughs> thing in. <laughs> Lauren says she didn't want to talk about AI. And I thought, okay, it's going to come up. I hate computers. Uh, <laughs> um, but you can, you can use things as models and you can bounce off of things. Mm -hmm. And um, I forget what you were, you, oh, you were asking about... Um, can you repeat what you said? No, I, I was talking about certain techniques techniques of, okay yeah of of, yeah. of of telling stories right i was just reading somewhere i forget who said this um that the great formal innovation or contribution of the novel is um free and direct dis discourse is that a ter is that a term you use in german probably not free and direct discourse but um and I think Jane Austen probably was one of the early writers in English to use it a lot, mm -hmm. where there's a, there's a consciousness and voice within a voice, within a voice. I mean, there's an establishing voice of the book, there's, a, in, there's an interior voice perhaps of a narrator, a character, and then within that there's a, there's a kind of dispensing of the apparatus of he said, she said, and you just get the pure thought of the character in, inside the character's head, and, but they're running the show, they're running the novel, and then the novel pulls back away from that and into a, an outer voice. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of what you mean? Yeah. 
Okay. That's the thing. I mean, this is <laughs> this. I mean, this is not a um, a new observation, but in English, at least, novel comes from the newness, right? I mean, I think um, I think even if one is not inventing free and direct discourse or uh, some of the, the, the developments by the modernists. Um, we're still taking in the world as it is now, which is profoundly different from the world as it was when Virginia Woolf was writing. And so we're still doing different things, right? We're still creating art that is responding to the world in a new way and possibly um, some of the developments now we're not going to be able to track until literary scholars look back in time and are able to understand what people are doing. So, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think all of the techniques are, have been discovered in novel writing. If I did, I would just quit. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, what is, nobody's ever written the books that you sit down to write either, right? So you are inventing the books as you're sitting down to, to wrestle with them and to put them into the world. Um, you're, you're building the boat as the boat is floating off into, like, Wanze, you know? Um, and, and it's like, it's frantic and it's difficult and you're trying to, to do it all at once. And so, every and it might not even be a boat. And it might not even be a boat. It could it be a might. bird. It right. Might, you're right, because <laughs> you're inventing the form. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You're inventing much more than when you write short stories. You're really inventing the form mm -hmm. of the novel mm -hmm. as you as you write it. Every time, yeah. You're adding rooms. You're doing however you want to metaphorize it, but it's like you're having to construct it, and suddenly it's new and different, and has an attic, and, or doesn't have an attic, mm -hmm. and has wheels. <laughs> um, but wherever inspiration comes from, be it from books, be it from your own mm -hmm. experience, from mm -hmm. something you've read in the paper or whatever, in order to write it, to construct it, you have to visit a certain part of your brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, what kind of place is this? I, I wanted to confront <laughs> you with a quote by Robert Olin Butler. You may like him or not. Yeah. He's also a professor of creative writing. And in Florida, you must know him. I don't. Oh. Um, the, 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 the title of his book says it all, Where Dreams Come From, The Process of Writing Fiction. And his mantra in many, many ways is, art does not come from ideas. Art does not come from the mind. Art comes from the place where you dream. Art comes from your unconscious. It comes from the white, hot center of you. How conscious how unconscious is the actual writing process? You have talked about writing first drafts very, very quickly, mm -hmm. which seems to be a rather unconscious process. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to actual writing, what does it mean to get into the zone, to be in a certain kind of flow when you write it? What is actual writing? I mean, I think it's all actual writing, right? You're sitting, I think, I think doing the dreamscape fast draft is actual writing, it is. You mean, you mean sitting down and belaboring the, the prose? Because, what do you mean? I think uh, scribbling, scribbling in my notebook and sketching out things mm -hmm. is, a, is fun and, and in a way easy to do. But it went to, 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 when it comes to writing, uh, to, to, to writing sentences which have a certain rhythm, mm -hmm. which work with one another and lead to a paragraph which is good. So this, for me, is a quite a, a really conscious thing to do. It's not improvised in many, many ways. I think it's all um, both, right? I, uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like definitive statements about writing, which is going to make tonight really tricky and interesting. Um, but I, I do think the, the first draft is actual writing, and I think I cannot do the late drafts until I do that, that, that impulsive stuff, right? And when you are sitting, you're trying to listen to the music, and you're trying to put things out onto the page. Um, that's a different part of your brain, um, but it's still connected to the all, all of the work that you've done to get to that place, all of the books that you've read, everything, everything builds you to that moment. It's all necessary, and it's all both conscious and not, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Robert Owen Butler said, that it, it is a dream. It's in that a novel is a living dream, that the fictional narrative is a living dream. But it, it means also that what, it means the same thing that dreams mean, which is dreams are telling you what's on your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the really kind of strange and embarrassing thing about being a fiction writer <laughs> is you're putting out into the world, this is what I've been thinking about for two years, or this is what's been on my mind. It's so intimate. It's, it's very intimate. It's the most intimate thing you can do. Right. With strangers. Here's what I've been dreaming in my waking hours, um, but this is, this is what I care about, mm -hmm. this is what I find interesting, mm -hmm. and if it fails, oh well. Um, but this is what I care about, this is what I find interesting, this, mm -hmm. is, this is what I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. so. To which extent do other art forms matter? I mean, you've written a great deal on TV and movies as well, as one can see in um, the essay collection I mentioned. And you've seen True Detective and The Wire and, and, uh, and, and so yeah. on. And there's strong competition between these genres. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they're all based on script and narrative. Right. But at the same time, they have another sort of um, imaginative power. Or how can I put it? Well, I did not grow up watching television. And I, I was hearing people, and, and I didn't watch television really at all. But I was hearing people talk about The Wire. Um, and they were, it was more in England I heard about it. Um, I didn't know anyone in Wisconsin who had watched The Wire. But then Barack Obama said his favorite character was Omar and this and that. I thought, I've got to watch this. And I started watching it and I was just drawn in. And um, I just thought it was incredibly important. And then I, when I went to find things in the American literary press, so the New York Review, the New Yorker, New York Times, there was virtually nothing written about The Wire. There was a tiny little thing in the New York Times. That's it. So I said to Bob Silvers, when he asked me if I'd like to do something that I didn't really want to do, I said, oh, I don't think I have time for that, but how would you like a piece on The Wire? Mm -hmm. And they had never really put television in there before. Um, and the makers of The Wire really thought of The Wire as a novel. And they would discuss it as a novel. Um, and they thought of it like, uh, like a Victor Hugo novel, really. Um, and Bob Silvers was very open. He said, great. So I started to be their go-to person on television. Then they started having other people do television, too. But the thing that I noticed most about that long-form um, narrative series thing that started to happen at the turn of the, at the early aughts, I guess, whether it's Friday Night Lights or, or The Wire or True Detective, that they could not work without the camera work, which was very much like film. It wasn't like the old-fashioned television. It was, it, was a, it was a beautiful kind of cinematography, especially in True Detective, great cinematography. Um, and the acting, the acting was astonishingly great. So the actors were co-authors of the, this novel that they were in. The characters were basically being written by the actors because they were so much better than the actual writing of, in the script. So I, I tried to make that point over and over again when I was writing, that the characters were the, were the authors here. And, and, and the depth of talent in the acting world is really so great. I really have great respect for actors. I mean, there's a lot of bad actors too, but... I totally but agree. Great that uh, The Wire is kind of the Balzac novel in the 20th century. Right. Everybody has said that. Right. Right. Uh, but I was also interested in the kind of, in, in, in the bigger than life aspect of all these forms, because writing is something very quiet. You have to find a sort of concentration, whereas the, 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 the series and the movie it draws you in, in other ways. 
do you feel the need to compete with, kind of, with this kind of energy? I think these shows that we just mentioned were not watched by a lot of people. I think they were, I mean, I know many people who just bailed on the wire. That they were slow, and, and that's another thing I said when I was writing them, about them, that they went slowly. The pace was slow. It wasn't typical television. Mm -hmm. Slow pace, lots of dialogue, the sort of, the slow, subtle things that the actors are doing were very, it, very similar to how a writer would describe a character. So I didn't really think it was big and bombastic and flashy and that, that writers had to compare or compete. I thought, I thought we were all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah, I think the thing poisoning art right now in general is this idea that we're all competing with one another. I think that that is actually a really poisonous idea. I mean, I don't think that we are competing for attention. and Attention is not a given, right? I, I don't think that um, we're competing against storytellers and other visual forms or other forms at all. We're not competing against music. Um, it's all the same river and we're all swimming in it. And we can take from other art forms as much as we possibly can. I mean, you look at um, Ondaatje's Coming Through Slaughter, it's entirely based on jazz. Right, and so like the, the structure is jazz, and the the language is jazz. He's borrowing from this other art form. He's not competing with it. We can borrow from uh, from television without competing with it. I, I, I think it's you know, I I'm, feel very passionate about this. In fact, um, we we all we all are entitled to, to participate in this. Right. I think now has come the time. Oh, that good. She gives an idea <laughs> of what okay. the Bastard Wilds um, sounds like. Okay. But not without telling us what the idea of going into the wilderness comes Okay, from. sure. Uh, so I. Uh, um, inspiration. The inspiration. Inspiration. The, the, the yes. inspiration, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, um, I am a secret survivalist. Uh, I wrote a, an article for Harper's about. I went to a, um, um, a survivalist camp for a few days and felt like I was about to die the whole time. Um, and yeah, it was really fun. Uh, but, and I, um, I'm also deeply interested in two strains in American literature, early American captivity not, not narratives, which are hyper-propagandistic, -propag right? They were, they were made in order to build the narrative that the, the good thing was to colonize North America. And I, was, and I also love Robinson Crusoe. Um, because I think Robinson Crusoe is like the most perfect indicator of um, England of its time, right? It's actually like he's he's very much um, embodying capitalism, <laughs> um, and I wanted to take these narratives and sort of turn them out and, and sort of think of them, uh, sort of think of the flesh of them or inside of them and and work against them in some ways. So. This is 1609, Jamestown, Virginia, and you will hear it from the beginning of the book. The moon hid itself behind the clouds. The wind spat in icy snow at angles. In the tall black wall of the palisade through a slit too seeming thin for human passage, the girl climbed into the great and terrible wilderness. Over her face she wore a hood drawn down, drawn low, and she was slight, both bony and childish small. But the famine had stripped her down yet starker, to root and string and fiber and sinew. Even so starved and blinded by the dark, she was quick. She scrabbled upright, stumbled with her first step, nearly fell, but caught herself and began to run, going fast over the frozen ruts of the field and all the stalks of dead corn that had come up in the summer already sooty and fruitless and stunted with blight. Swifter girl, she told herself, and in her fear and anguish her legs moved yet faster. These good boots the girl had stolen off the son of a gentleman, a stripling half her age but of equal size, who had died of the smallpox the night before, the rash or rust spreading of the starved bones. These leather gloves and the thick cloak the girl had stolen off her own mistress. She banished the thought of the woman still weeping upon her knees in the frozen ground in the courtyard inside that hellish place. With each step she drew away, everything there loosened its grip on the girl. 
Yet there was a strange gleam upon the dark ground of the field ahead, and as she moved, she saw it was the undershirt of a soldier who a fortnight earlier had been caught worming his body slow from the horrors of the fort and toward the different horrors of the forest. He had made it halfway to the trees, when in silence a shadow that had lain upon the ground grew denser, grew upward, came clear at last as the fearsomest of the men of this country, the warrior two heads taller than the men of the fort, who made himself yet more terrible by wearing upon his shoulders outstretched a broad, dark mantle of turkey feathers. He had lifted with one hand the creeping fearful soldier by his hair, and had with a knife cut a long, wet, red mouth into the man's throat. Then he drip dropped him to spill his heart's blood into the frozen earth, and there the dead man lay splayed ignoble. All this time he had lain unburied, for the soldiers of the settlement had become too weak and too cowardly in their hunger to fetch the body back. She had passed the dead man, and his reek had drawn itself out of her nostrils, and she was nearly to the woods when she stumbled again, for the thought of these two men gave rise to thoughts of other men who had lurked, perhaps, in the woods, men out there hidden and awaiting her. And now, as she peered before her into the dark of the forest, she saw a man crouching in ambush in ever deeper, blacker shadow of each tree, perhaps a man with a knife or an axe or an arrow and cold murder in his eye. She stopped her running for a breath, but she had no choice. She took her courage up again, and she ran on. And as she ran, each imagined man, in passing, revealed himself to be mere shadow again. OK, that's it. Lori, you get an arc when they come. I'm sorry I haven't given you an arc yet. No. Well, yes, okay. Okay, good. Uh, before you have the chance to ask your own questions, we go on a little, but you can already think about something you would like to know, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we, we still have to talk about another form of inspiration. Joni Mitchell, wait, we're going to sing. Joni Mitchell? We have to we we're include sing the Joni Mitchell we're chapter. We're going to sing. Yeah. Yeah. Can we well, we're, song you know? Well, first of all, we have to find out what Gregor's favorite album is. I think... Is it Hegira? Mm, yes, Hegira and, and even Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and when, as soon as she started Despite playing with Jaco Pastorius, yeah, it was, it was Pistorius fantastic. Was the most amazing bassist ever. <laughs> died in, from Florida. Oh! And died in Florida. Oh. Born As we all do. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who goes there gets sucked in for life. Oh, he never escaped. Well, he did escape, but then he had to go back. I know. He had a terrible death. Oh. Lori <laughs> knows all the terrible deaths. She told me about yeah. the death of Jane Austen last night. It was oh, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so awful. It was awful. Oh. But he did a lot of bad things to get into... Jaco? Yeah, the dark oh. zone. Jaco. Yeah. He was mentally ill, mm. and he was trying to play with Carlos Santana in that bar. In that bar, in Jack, was it in Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville, somewhere in Florida? Anyway, he got he got beat up by bouncers. Mm. He was stabbed, I think. He was even, stabbed. I think he was stabbed. Oh, I didn't. I thought he was just beaten to death. <laughs> I, I, I think it, it, it leads us off in other reasons. Maybe we just mentioned for the audience, we were just talking backstage about but an this appearance is a good Joni made in Washington at the Library yeah, of Congress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Singing you have summertime. to watch it at YouTube. And mm -hmm. she's even singing a song, Gershwin's Summertime. Summertime. And it works. She's, and she's singing it in her very low register. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's lovely. Cigarettes and red wine. Yep. Mm. Yep. The inspiration I meant is autobiography. <laughs> We've left that out no. so far. And I can I quote think... you from your own essay. Oh. It's 30 years old. Oh. <laughs> and, it's, and it's called, 30. It's Better to Write Than Be a Writer, uh -huh. which is a great line. You can have it. It's 30 years <laughs> old. <laughs> and you say, autobiography can be a useful tool. It coaxes out the invention. 
Actually, invention and autobiography coaxed out each other. The pen takes refuge from one in the other, looking for moral dignity and purpose in each, and then flying to the arms of the other. All the energy that goes into the work, the force of imagination and concentration, is a kind of autobiographical energy, no matter what one is actually writing about. I agree totally, but what does that mean in, in the midst of the autobiographical floods of fiction we have these days? I think everybody Are we talking, is writing. Oh, autofiction? Are we talking autofiction? Auto autobiography, autofiction, yes. It wasn't that bad at the time. Well, I, I don't, I, I, you know, something, this is, I think, again, an invention of publishers. Like, sort of like YA, I think autofiction has become that, and maybe writers have cooperated. But the autobiographical novel has always existed, as long as there have been novels. Um, it's how much the writer wanted to sort of say that the novel was autobiographical or how much readers could tell, it varied, but, but you know, that was just a recognized thing, that the autobiographical novel. Now there's this thing called autofiction where, what? What is autofiction? I mean, autofiction has always existed, right? And it, I think it comes out of a French tradition um, from mid-century, but it, I mean, it's, it's now this You're new... distinguishing it from autobiographical fiction? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it was so its own. It was? Yeah. I think it has a, yes. Yes, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Are you, are you, yeah. but are you including people like Natalie Sorot? And, yes, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't include no. her. No. I wouldn't well, include Well, I her. think it, it could do for me, it's, okay, I don't know. Um, I, will, I will give up on this and go home and Wikipedia it. Um, <laughs> no, okay, but I, I do think you're right. I mean, I do, so I just read for the O. Henry Prize, um, and the vast majority of the stories I got, which were thousands of stories, were in first person, and I think that people are really um, afraid of the god eye of third person, right? I think people are are not, don't have a lot of confidence in anything but the individual experience and are writing out of that individual experience over and over again to, I think, the detriment of possible art um, because it has become to feel solipsistic, right? It has become to feel sort of this, this enclosed um, space of the self. Um, but I don't think, you know, I mean, I think th there are as many types of books as there are writers. And I think you're right, there is a, um, a publicity push to sort of, to, to pay a lot of attention to this kind of book. Do you disagree? Because you teach students and you know what they're interested yeah. in. I mean, I do think, I mean, I, and I remember when, when I was an undergrad, I just taught undergraduates this past fall, and they, they tend to like to write in the first person. Mm -hmm. And I remember, feeling the same way when I was that age because I thought, who's saying it if it's not in the first person? Mm -hmm. Who is saying, Joe went to the store? Who says that? Mm -hmm. I mean, and who is it? I mean, I thought, is there someone else in the room? <laughs> I mean, so I didn't understand how to, to work the voice of the story, and, and I think young writers don't, and they, so they, but I think you're also right that there's this idea that, that all experience is subjective and you, you put it in a first person voice. Songs are mostly written in the, in the first person. There's some third person songs. Um, but, um, I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that we're living within just the tsunamis of misinformation coming from all sides. And so the center of authority feels a little bit shaky. Like what is authority at the moment and, and can we have faith in it, right? Or is everything opinion? So if everything's opinion, why not claim it as the, the center, the, the burning center of art? I don't know. But you didn't find in among the first person stories that you were reading you didn't find that the narrator had the same name as the author. Sometimes, actually, a lot of times. Well, I would say, and they were know, a writer. Forty percent. Wow. The time. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. So there's that, a, yeah. yeah. Well, there's that's autofiction. That is autofiction. Yeah. Yes. And that's new. I think that's new. Ish. I think it's very old. I think. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, it's as old as 
novels. I mean, I, but what was it called? It was a, where the narrator had the same name as the author, and it was called fiction. Well, um, Cervantes, right? I mean, I think um, Don Quixote, uh -huh. right? Because I mean, there's, there's that, that whole Cervantes. Split when there's he a came out and wrote the second part, um, and he was writing about the writing of Quixote. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it's, it's been around forever. Think. But that's more, thing. yeah. I'm, is that the same? I, I wouldn't call that the same. Okay. Okay. I mean, there, there's no way to escape autobiography. That's what you say in this paragraph. I just quoted. Mm -hmm. That's up to right. Yeah. You invest yourself completely. Right. Uh, with your mind, with your body. Right. In the, in the writing process. Right. But there comes, a, there can come a time when you exploit your own life, and that is what's happening today, very mm -hmm. often. And this also maybe has a way to do with identity politics and so on. You have to tell your own story to make yourself visible and so on. Mm -hmm. And this may be one of the reasons. And, and I think autofiction needs a kind of self-reflection mm -hmm. that I'm telling my story in an artistic way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just uh, a document. Mm -hmm. I think what I was trying to say there, though who knows, it was 30 years ago, I <laughs> who can recall? Um, that invention and autobiography give each other energy and create this thing together. So it's like a synergistic um, collision of energies. Is that what, sort of what I said? I profoundly agree with that. <laughs> That, that is correct. Yeah. And, then, and then what you have is not precisely autobiography, but what you have, it, it's autobiographical in its origins and in its energies and its concerns, perhaps. Because again, you have Robert Owen Butler's waking dream thing, and you know, this is, this is what your brain is working on as you sleep, as you write, as you wash the dishes. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's one related question, because for most, for most artists it will be difficult to tell about their motifs and leitmotifs of their writing. Maybe there's just one topic you go after over and over again. N knowing that you do or not knowing that you do? It depends. <laughs> I mean, some, some do, some don't. Yeah. Um, I, I did discover, and this is unconscious, but once I realized in this novel that I was doing the same thing, I thought, well, this is, this is my thing, I guess. Um, and so I didn't try to shake loose of it. But in, in, I, I think probably I understand how short stories are written a little better than novels. But in each of my novels, somebody turns, the, the main character turns their back on a sibling <clears throat> in order to engage in a fantastical love. And that's in every single one of my novels. Wild! And it's not, and it's not conscious, and no reviewer would ever notice it, but if any are out there, you, it's yours. <laughs> um, but they all do that. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, this is the, you know, the yeah. whole, they all have, and, it, and, it's, and it's to the detriment of the, of the sibling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, another way of putting it would draw on the famous quote by Sir Berlin in his Tolstoy essay about the hedgehog and the fox. And it yeah, goes yeah. like that, a fox knows many things, mm -hmm. right. but a hedgehog knows one big thing. Right. That is to say, a fox type of person tries to move around and get things right. quickly and sniffs in every right. corner, while the hedgehog moves very slowly and doesn't mm -hmm. get anywhere. So what, what, kind of, what kind of writer are you, a fox or a hedgehog? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh God. Uh, oh, we're foxes. We're foxes. We're tall foxes. We're foxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, we're, I think we're both foxes. Yeah, I think we're both interested in many things. Um, we're not like Marguerite Duras, who wrote the same story over and over and over Who's again. Who's that? Duras. Oh, Duras. Yeah. 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 Oh. Right. Right. Over and over and over. And beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, but she built her whole life on that story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think all of our books are different. 
I think you have to be for a short to be a short story writer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when, and when someone comes along and says Lauren Groff's characters are all so different, where do they come from? How does she imagine all these different characters? Don't you feel that as a, a compliment? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all the people around me. I right? mean, yeah. my mother used to say that my father would read my work and she'd listen to him, sometimes chuckle, sometimes, you know, go, hmm. <laughs> and in the end, he would put the book down and go, how does Laurie come up with this stuff? You know, because mm -hmm. he didn't recognize mm -hmm. anything really. But there is some stuff from him and my family in there, but whatever. It just seemed new and crazy and different every time. And that's good. That's mm -hmm. what we hope for. Mm -hmm. Even though we are drawing from autobiographical things and energies, mm -hmm. we hope it's different and new. It has to feel new and different to us in order to be able to write it. And terrifying. I think it has to feel terrifying also. Mm -hmm. If it feels not scary, then it's probably not something we should be doing. Yeah, in some ways you think, this will probably get me locked up in an mm. insane asylum, mm. but it's what I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> or else not writing it will get me locked up in an insane asylum. So. Yeah. No, my book's pretty weird. Your book's more normal. It's not. You haven't read it. It's really not normal. But you know this is weird. Oh, it's so weird. It's very weird. Yeah. My, oh, yeah. my book is very weird. Oh, wow. Before yeah. I go on, you would now have the chance to ask if you want to know anything. I wouldn't even see you raise a hand out there in the dark. And I don't even have an idea whether there's a mic. Oh, nice. okay. Oh, that's wonderful. People have questions. So, oh. Okay. Um, so here, we just, just in the second it. row. Yes, please. Gregor Vokola. You Do you have any siblings, and how do they feel about your work? <laughs> yeah, um, I, do, I do. I have three siblings. My, I have a brother who is no longer alive, but I have another brother who is, and sister. And um, he, they haven't noticed that aspect. And in fact, I, no one's noticed that. I mean, and I didn't notice that aspect until I'd written, until I was writing this fourth. This is my fourth novel. And so it took four books doing this for me to notice that, that, that it had, all the novels had that in common. What does that mean? It means that I have some, probably some sense of grief, guilt, trauma, emotion attached to something, to something with my siblings. Perhaps I've turned my back on them a little bit and, and there's something there. But is it like any of the, story, the novels I've written? Not really, no. But, but it's the same kind of paradigm. Same thing. So, I don't know. I did send this book off to my sister, and I haven't heard back. <laughs> so, we'll see. We'll see. People are busy. Sure. <laughs> Guy over there. In the back. Yes, please. Hi, um, I just wanted if either of you had started a novel and quit writing that novel, and what makes you sit with writing something, seeing it through to the end? All the time, yeah. Uh, between all of my books, I've written at least one novel that I will never go back to, and I think it's, um, it's just not interesting enough to stick with all the way to the end, I think. That's, I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm trying to ask a big story or ask a big question, and sometimes the question is not as big as I thought it was at the beginning. I just was reading a piece on, was, was this a recent piece? I don't know where, I, you know, when you read things on the internet, you don't know whether they're from yesterday or from the 18th century. You have no idea, you forget. Um, but it was, about abandoned novels, and Michael Chabon was quoted. He had a couple that he, or at least one that he abandoned. I think his first one, Jenny Egan's mm -hmm. first novel, she abandoned. Um, but did you read that piece? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Might, have been, <laughs> Might have been from long ago. Who knows? Um, 
And I thought, wow, that's so interesting because I don't really have that. I have novels I've started or things that I've started that then I forget about and then I find later and I think, well, that is a version of what I ended up writing, but it's sort of inert. Or Sometimes I think, oh, this has some usable stuff. I mean, all these writers who were interviewed for this article did say that their abandoned novels were mineable. You know, there were stuff that they could use in another novel. Um, but I am too slow a writer to get to the end of an entire novel and have a spare novel and say, oh, this doesn't work. I will, I will just make it work. I will, I will flog it. I say, you are going out there. You have to go to school. Yeah. I don't, so I don't have an unfinished novel, but it's very common. Mm -hmm. It's very common, it, yeah. It's probably a sign of being a real writer. I no. Swear. No. I, I think it, it's just if you have faith that the, the story is going to come back to you. And I, I have faith that if the story wants to be written, it'll come back at some point, And I'll be able to write it better in the form that it needs to take. And I know that sounds really mystical, but it happens all the time, right? I, I try to write a story or a novel. I can't quite get it. Um, but I know that if I've lived longer, I can, I can get to the point where I'm, I can find the music, I can find the form, and I can, I can actually tell the story. So it's not abandoning, it's just putting it aside until it wants to be reborn in a better, different form. Yeah. And you're good at that. You do, you do go back to things that I rework. Do. Yeah, I yeah. remember that at, when you were a student. Yeah, yeah. You were right. very good. My first story I gave to Lori was actually one of my failed novels that I wrote before I got to the grad program. I wrote three before I got there. And then I was like, oh my god, I have to give a story to Lori Moore. What am I going to do? And I, um, I wrote um, Elder Barton Elliott, which is for your class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank god you taught me that. Thank you. <laughs> Things will come back. Yeah, in, in the middle. Yeah. Um, oh, you no. mentioned um, having to go to, when you're, when you're writing a novel, Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Um, mm, yeah. Families and life, like how do you yeah. balance being in that place that you want to be in with and don't want to be in mm -hmm. in your case? And what's, yeah, what's that struggle or what's that, that dichotomy? What is that like? I, w I once wrote a piece about this, well, like, what is it like to write a novel? And I said it's really like being in the Detroit airport <laughs> in the 80s, which was a crummy old airport. It was sort of painted burnt, burnt orange. And, and outside, you could see they were building a new airport. And so it was basically like, living in one old airport while you're watching the new airport be built. Another analogy would perhaps be the Golden Gate, is it the Golden Gate? It's the, the, Bay, the Bay Bridge. I don't know, where, where people were driving, but they built, they built the bridge alongside the one that was being used, mm -hmm. right? And they, you know, so, so the idea is, you know, you're using and living one place, but there's this other sort of fantastical construction and version and a new thing that is happening alongside it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and in novel writing, you actually can go back and forth in between those two things. And it's, it's a kind of mental illness that's sanctioned by society. So <laughs> we're fine with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I find, um, I know this was probably, uh, that was so beautiful, but uh, this is a, a more practical thing, and I, I have to trick myself, actually. So it's, it's a, a series of tricks, and one of them is I get up very early in the morning and I get started, and then I'm done for the day. And eventually, halfway through the process of writing a book, life starts to talk back to the novel, and the novel starts to, so there's this moment for me, and maybe for you too, when everything just sort of opens up. And, and you go to the grocery store, 
And you're like, oh, I can use this, right? Like this observation, oh my God, my novel's speaking back into my life. And it's, but it takes a while for me and it takes a lot of drafts and it takes just tricking myself to get up in the morning and, and just do the work and have faith that it's going to happen. I, th I think it's important to have your life and what, you, what you're doing and what you're, again, what you're caring about and thinking about and even what you're shopping for um, somehow be part of your work, otherwise you're, you're not, you know, you're going to be too divided. Like I was saying to a student who was, he's working on code in, in Portland. He's, he's a coder th this semester. I said, you just, you got to get that coding stuff into your fiction because, you know, first of all, not that many writers know how to code. <laughs> so get that in there. Also, you don't want to have your brain divided that much. You want to sort of use both those things. Um, but there is a point, I mean, you're talking about the moment when your novel opens up and you can put things in it, but there's also a moment where the novel closes, mm -hmm. where the world of the novel suddenly has its own rules and imperatives and energies and can no longer take in any more from the outside. It has to work out its own issues and dramas and details and it just closes out everything else mm -hmm. but there is that interesting moment where anything can drop in everything yeah. it just drops in it's like, wonderful <laughs> it feels so good right you live through, you live, you're living in both worlds it's, it's like, like the city in the city, city by china mieville right you're in both worlds at the same time behind the lady who just spoke please yeah. <laughs> so this is probably a huge question but i'm gonna ask it anyways um in your experience what is it that or what is the best way to make a novel believable and immersive? <laughs> 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 uh, so tricks, right? Um, so one of the tricks that I try to do is um, before I write any scene for the uh, one of the end points, right? So I'm, I'm writing a lot of really fast drafts, and then I finally get to the, the final draft. Um, and this is a, such a cheesy trick, but I love it, and it works at any point, right? And you can do this anywhere. But um, I do like a very slow bodily meditation about the scene that I'm about to get into, right? So, so I will shut down all senses, and I will slowly, with a timer, open up. Say the first one will be hearing, and I'll try to hear what's happening in this the, around the scene, right? Is there bird song? Is there are there waves happening, right? Because I do, I believe our truths live within our bodies. I think that we are animals, right? And we respond emotionally through the body and through what we're feeling. A lot of cues are happening at all times that we're not actually consciously taking in, but they're, they're sort of um, building our emotional state. So, um, so I, I do this exercise, and, and that's how I try to make things believable. It's by centering everything on physical experience um, through the senses. And then you get so much information out of this. This It's so lovely. You, have, you almost get too much information. And then you have to decide what is important for the scene, right? And then, and then the scene sort of writes itself, I think. You have sort of the, the conversation happening, the power struggle happening, whatever, between people. Um, but then you, you know so much about it, right? And if you believe in it, hopefully the reader will as well. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I... I... Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, all five senses on every page, mm -hmm. and you can you can subtract later. Mm -hmm. But also, all art is an act of concentration. Mm -hmm. And if you really, really concentrate and bring all that concentration to the page, the reader will feel that, or you you know you just assume they will. They will not feel it if you're writing casually and off to one side mm -hmm. of your own self. If, you, if you're concentrating and writing from the center of yourself, a reader will feel that and will be joining you on that, you know, on that, in that story, I think. I think, luck. yes, yeah. And I think um, writers have different um, feelings about this, but I believe that there's no writing that you do toward the book that is wasted, right? So, and part of that for me is that 
even if I've written a, a thousand extra pages, they're going to be in the book itself, right? It's, it's going to build the world in a way that, that's sort of underneath the surface that maybe the reader can't feel, but there's authority there, right? And there's authority there because I, I know that stuff, right? And I feel that stuff. So it's, it's partially tricking yourself. It's partially just finding that white hot center and speaking out of it as well. Maybe two more, right in the front. Yeah. yeah so, uh, two questions from Colin. Um, I think the first one is you mentioned that you're doing like a draft of the draft. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm curious, how do you know that it's finished? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned thousands of pages. How do you know that it's finished, that it's like a done product and it can go out to the reader? It's the first question. The second one would be um, mentioned earlier that creating art is, in a way, responding to the world right to the world right now. So I'm curious how is Matrix is responding to the world right Sure. Now? Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, um, if I forget one of the questions, I'm going to answer that one first. Um, Matrix w was never meant to be only a 12th century book, right? It, from the beginning, I always saw it as a way to talk about things um, in the, the 21st century. Uh, in a way that was a little bit slantwise, right? So what I wanted to do was write a book like Penelope Fitzgerald's The Blue Flower, where um, there's sort of a resonance between time, um, and the time is talking back and forth. Uh, so I actually feel like it's a very topical book. It's okay if nobody else agrees, but I believe, I believe that it is. Um, so, and I'm putting all the urgencies of my interest in that book. What was your first question again? Uh, the, when we the book's done. Oh, when is it done? Oh, right. So Lori's had that beautiful idea, and, and now we're seeing the novel as a flower, right? So it opens, but it also closes. And I think that there's a point when you get to, when you get to the point where um, it has told you everything it knows about itself, right? And, and then it's sort of, it's, it's sealing itself up. And that's when I know that now's the draft where I pay deep, deep attention to the sentence, right? And I'm, I'm sort of working the sentences and trying to get to better, deeper ideas um, and more layered ideas. So I think it's, it's when you feel, when you feel the, the slow aperture like closing, that's when you know that the, the thing is close to finished. And then it's not, like she said, uh, nothing's, no, a novel's imperfect, right? It's never going to be perfect. At some point you just have to abandon it. Right, it's, and if you know you can't fix what's wrong with it, then you're done. Yeah. <laughs> In the front, and then the last one back there. Yes, please. Me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, Lauren, Lauren can speak to this too because this is a question probably we both get a lot and it's a hard one to answer but um, I almost always know that something is a story and not a novel. A novel has a stereophonic aspect, it, it straddles time usually, at least when I'm doing it, it, it just requires longer, it, it requires more space, larger canvas. Um, there was a maybe one long story that I wrote that I had hopes that it would somehow be longer. <laughs> I didn't know if it was a novel, but I thought, this could be a novel. But that only happened to me once. Um, and it really didn't turn into a novel. It turned into a long short story. Oh, well. Um, but some people have the pleasant surprise of finding a short story turning into a novel. My agent would be so happy if that happened to me, but it doesn't. But do you want to talk yeah, to Yeah, I think the concerns of the novel and the short story are profoundly different. And I think the concerns of the novel are, um, are, are for, for me, I know it's a novel when it's bigger than I can actually look at at one point. And at this point, I don't write a story unless it, is, it, it comes to me whole, right? And you can't, you can't do that with a novel, right? You have to be sort of taken by this idea or this something for a novel and, and sort of try to look into it, but it's all dark, right? 
for me, it's I, like I, I carry around my stories for a long time. My, um, some of my last few stories um, that have appeared, I've carried around for 20 years and haven't been able to tell them, right? And, until suddenly I have it, right? And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just apparent to me from the beginning. And it's apparent to you from the yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see in someone's work, like John Updike, that he that he saved all the stuff he really cared about mm -hmm. for his short he stories. Did. He did. The sh it's all in there, mm -hmm. all the emotional life and and the stuff that he was thinking about and thought was a kind of portrait of the nation. Mm -hmm. He put in his novels. So big. So they're right. big, yeah. right? But the yeah. stories are better. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Stories yes. are much better. Yeah. The last one on the left, yeah. Um, hi. So my question is around your, your routine. I'm really interested in the ways in which different artists wake up really early and then they write for a certain amount of hours and they take a break. And Laura, can talk a lot about how, you know, you have these tricks. So is there, is there anything you can share with us about your process of your relationship? Yeah, um, everyone's different, right? Uh, I, if I weren't to wake up in the morning and start, I probably wouldn't write at all because I'm very lazy. Um, so I, I have to get up and, and go when I'm still dreaming and just like and not let the, the voice in. Um, the Grace Paley, who's a homunculus sitting here yelling at me. Um, and it's really her because she once yelled at me. But um, where's, where's your coffee? Don't you oh make God, coffee right away? It's like a whole... So you start Pause. with the coffee. Oh, yes. No, I take it up with things. I'm drinking it as I get started. Yeah. Yes. So you don't wait for it to kick in. No, no. I don't want to be awake, right? I want to, I want to still be dreaming. And then you want to come awake And then the you coffee. come awake slowly. You, like, you work your way into the book. It's very gentle. Yeah. Um, it's very nice. And then if you get stuck, you can meditate and come back to it. It's really yeah. lovely. And then I'm done by... 10 or 11 most days, um, and then I go exercise, because that's also part, tending to the physical body, to the animal, it's good. Mm. How about you, Laurie, what's your... What's your uh, I have no exercise, no meditation. <laughs> <laughs> I stagger to the coffee pot. <laughs> I hardly know where I am until I drink two cups. And then, well, there's Wordle. <laughs> The Wordle thing happened to me last year. It's really sad. I met a bunch of writers in North Carolina who were doing Wordle, and I said, what is that? And now, mm, uh. um, yesterday was very hard. Was, it, was the word dwelt? Did anyone do Wordle? No, okay. It was hard. Didn't you think dwelt was hard? so many ways to waste my time. Yeah, so I get started later than Lauren, but... Um, but it also depends on what I'm working on and where, mm -hmm. where I am in it. So I'm a little more scattered. So, but everybody has their own ways. But, but the thing that's key is probably exercise is key. You're supposed to exercise in the morning, which I think is a waste of your coffee. <laughs> so I don't recommend that. I think the coffee, get the coffee on the page. And then worry about the exercise later, but, okay. Okay, and let me wrap up things with two last short questions. A German writer friend of mine, Christoph Peters, never starts a new novel without having plans for the next three or four. They are not even sketched out, it's just the idea of a genre. He says, I have to write a contemporary pirate novel or whatever. Um, He's just afraid of running out of ideas mm. on a very basic level. Mm. Do you have any plans for the next decade? <laughs> That's terrifying. I, I'm so scared right now. I, I did until yeah. this question. <laughs> <laughs> now they've all just vanished from my head. Um, I always feel I'll, I'll never run out of ideas, but maybe, oh, oh God, that's, that that's bad luck to say that. That you will and you won't at the same time. I'm going to run out of time and energy before ideas, I think. Mm -hmm. Time and energy is really what I worry about more than ideas. But maybe I've got that wrong. Maybe, I sh maybe once you have the ideas down, the time and energy sort of are automatic. I don't know. I've got to, I may have it backward. Mm -hmm. But... 
what do you I think? Don't know. There are ideas and there are ideas that seize you and take over your life, right? Yeah. And I think those are really rare. Um, I don't want to run out of those, but those are almost like a gift that you can foresee or even hope for, and they just sort of become. But you're you're writing and writing something now. Yeah, but I, I just, it's the most insane thing I've ever done in my life, and nobody's going to read it but me, and that's fine. What do you mean? Oh, well, you'll read it. And, <laughs> you're and you'll tell me this is insane. No, oh, yeah. no, I like I like insane. Mm -hmm. It's good. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're both, mo we have books that are coming out that have not come out yet, and we're both moved on to the next thing, mm -hmm. and we'll see how that works, and, and we're open to other ideas that come along. I mean, you're much younger than I am, so you, your brain is still on fire. <laughs> My brain, I'm, I don't know, I mean, I do notice that writers after the age of 73? <laughs> have you noticed this? You have, you have been talking about this. This is a band called Late Style. Right, the, 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 the writing's not that good. But so sometimes, or, I mean there are exceptions, not that many. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, you can pick a number, but after a certain, I mean, everybody was praising the Cormac McCarthy books that came out because he was 90, but apparently he wrote them like 18 years ago, yeah. <laughs> and they had been in a drawer. What about Jane Kutzea? <laughs> Pardon? What, what about Kutzea, for instance? Right. Kutzea? Mm -hmm. um, well, he did his best work before he was 73. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, that, that's yeah. a matter of opinion, but my opinion is the same as his. <laughs> are people saying he's doing his best work yes. now? Yeah, people think that the Jesus books are his best books. What? I know. Oh. I disagree. I disagree. Yeah. He's adventurous, yes. that's for sure. Yeah. We He's can discuss that, but I have one very last question. Okay. I just want to turn around the initial questions. Where do novels come from? <laughs> I ask you, where does it lead to writing novels, except for a stage? Oh, no. In the English theater. It leads to the next novel. Yes, that's right. That's the right answer. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> I think you have to sign.